All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So we have one more rock star with us today. I know that many of you think that we should now form a band and start having our rock star tours very soon. So I think as soon as pandemic is over, we'll do that. We have with us Dr. Eric Osgood. He is an internist. He is also the medical director for the hospitalist uh, department in St. Francis Medical Center, Trenton. He uh, received his medical degree from Tufts University School of Medicine, and he is an internal medicine specialist. So Dr. Osgood, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. It's great to be here. This has uh, been very looking forward to this. Perfect. And and just for the uh, <laughs> for the curious minds here, Dr. Osgood's uh, bean name is Jelly Bean. <laughs> And he right. decided to have that name Jelly Bean because he thought he cannot draw as good as me. I think he can draw better, but he was being humble. And so he said, out of my jealousy for the art, his name is Jelly Bean. So Jelly Bean, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. I'll try not to be too jelly. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you, you, you jelly, bro? So um, <laughs> I'm going to very quickly show the link where folks can find you. So folks, if you go to this uh, link, and this link is present in the description as well, here there is more information about Dr. Osgood and how to reach him. There is this Twitter link here as well, which is also in the description. And there are questions here, which we will ask him at a later part of the discussion. And this is, of course, drbean.com. So with this, my request to the cool beans here, please hold on to your questions for a few minutes. I want to go ahead with some part of the discussion about COVID and then your questions are welcome as well. So Dr. I would just say that, that that link that you showed is my hospital practice. So hopefully people don't need me there. Um, anybody who's in New Jersey and interested in telemedicine um, can email me at doc, Dr. Oh so good at gmail.com. Dr. Oh so good. One word at gmail.com. Got it. Dr. Oh so good. Yeah. Dr. O H O S O G O O G. Yeah. Dr. Oh so good at gmail.com. Got it. Perfect. Thank you very much. So with this, let's start. Uh, once again, welcome to you from me and from the Cool Beans here. First question, in your practice nowadays, are you helping patients or people with prophylaxis from COVID? And how, if you are? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've been doing that and I really started doing that before vaccines were widely available. And, I, you know, we saw the, some of the prophylaxis data around ivermectin and I thought that you know, the body of evidence that existed in concert with the safety, low cost and, and favorable profile of that drug and the general absence of vaccines, I thought it was something that would be favorable. Now that um, vaccines are more widely available, what I really try to do is have a dis you know, people who do come to me for that service. I tr try to really have a good, robust uh, discussion with them about getting vaccines. Um, I acknowledge there are some people, no matter what I say, who are not going to do it, um, in which case that's the route that I choose. But, you know, I, I, I really encourage them to continue thinking about that. A lot of times they're really reading different sources that they maybe don't find trustworthy. If they find me trustworthy, I try to give them a balanced discussion about why it's so important to get vaccinated. And I've had some successes with that. There were people who were against it who ended up agreeing and going to get it. And if not, um, at least they've had some degree of protection instead of none. So I, I think that that's an important harm reduction strategy. Um, and so that's uh, that's been the, the, the way that I approach that. Others have been interested in like post exposure prophylaxis, so similar. Um, and then I haven't had as much opportunity for early treatment just because I happen to live in a state with a lot of both seroprevalence as well as uh, vaccine uptake. And um, both in the hospital and in the in the telemedicine arena, I haven't been seeing much uh, acute active COVID uh, lately. Uh, long haul is another area where I've been uh, in practice, and I unfortunately um, am uh, seeing long haul patients. And uh, that's a that, you know that's a challenging patient population. I really have a lot of sympathy for these patients who have, after months and months, still not been feeling well and hard to recover. And we're trying to use really, uh, whether it be precision medicine, uh, where I'm starting to work with Dr. Yokendra and Dr. Patterson, um, as well as just using just sort of repurposed drugs and, and uh, sort of, I guess, common sense medicine and trying to repurpose the pharmaceuticals we have at our disposal with what we know about the pathophysiology of the disease and some of our expert experience to try to get people better, just kind of with the, that, that empiric approach. 
and it's a slow go. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, but we do start to see some improvement. And so that's been very rewarding as well. Right. And then from time to time, we still do get the COVID patients that do come in the hospital. And they, they of course, are, um, you know, uh, a challenging patient population as well. But luckily, knock on wood, we have not been seeing much of that in, in recent weeks to the month. Got it. Thank you very much. So I want to go back for a second towards the prophylaxis. I am interested in in the way you articulate the uh, the balanced approach towards vaccines. So full disclosure to folks here, uh, I think everybody knows, and if somebody does not, I am pro-vaccine. I have vaccine. I have both doses of vaccine. I had Moderna. My family has vaccines vaccinated and now my brother is here he's fully vaccinated as well so my question to you uh, dr osgood when you have a patient who does not feel great about a vaccine what is the discussion what are the main points that you discuss and what is your uh, what is your opinion how do you present the data to them well i mean i think it really requires an honest discussion and you can't i mean you can't lie to people and tell them that anything is 100 percent safe and you can't lie to people and tell them that we know everything uh and really the the caricature that is painted of people who are hesitant about the vaccine that they think they're going to become magnetized and that they think it's going to give them 5g haha ha, like that's funny to joke about but that's really not what people are saying generally the 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 the, uh, the things that people are concerned about are things like lack of you know, long-term safety data and um, just general sort of distrust about the pharmaceutical industry and you know the, the speed with which vaccines were rolled out. And these are things that if you actually take the time to explain to people and give a balanced perspective about risk benefit, the risks of actually how severely you may get ill from the actual virus versus the very low incidence of serious side effects from the vaccine, it's it's not as self-explanatory as some might, people might think. People are consuming information, news, and podcasts from all different sorts of people who are saying things that aren't necessarily backed up by science and data. And I, you know, I really don't like the way that people who are worried and hesitant about the vaccine are treated with a lot of derisive language and dismissed and mocked and made fun of. I think it's a, it's a natural psychological reaction to have these concerns. And I think um, a trusted physician having this real heart to heart discussion without being judgmental is something that people need. And uh, sometimes you do have to hold people's hands through this and give them that balanced perspective. And when they hear that, oh, you're vaccinated, you go, oh, every single one of your family members, every one of your patients. Interesting, because in some cases, all the news and content that they're consuming is people raising alarm bells about things from the vaccine adverse reporting set and, and theor theoretical ideas about what the spike protein is going to do when when you present that balanced perspective of the science, some people you're not going to reach. And no matter what you say, there's just no way they're going to do it, or at least they are going to wait a little bit longer. But, so, you know, people might be surprised the extent to which people, if they do hear that balanced perspective, will agree and they'll go get their shot. And the other thing I can offer is you go get your first mRNA shot, you get your next one, which is either going to be in three weeks or four weeks, depending on if it's Pfizer or Moderna, respectively. You're not going to be fully protected for what about six weeks or so. So I can give a six week supply of ivermectin as kind of like um, an incentive to say, look, take it for now. But I want you to, when you go pick up that ivermectin, I want you to get your vaccine. And if you're worried about that spike protein getting into your vasculature, well, hey, we know ivermectin. You know, we have pretty good evidence that it binds to the spike protein. It's anti-inflammatory. It may mitigate some of those uh, vaccine side effects, offer some prophylaxis effect while those antibodies are, are kicking in and giving you that response. And, um, I, you know, you win some, you lose some, but I've, I'm, I've, I feel that getting one or two or three more people vaccinated who had no intention of doing it ha adds a lot to, to population health and, and public safety and well-being. And I, I feel good about that effort. I totally agreed with you. I have been uh, discussing this with the cool beans here, that if the healthcare authorities, instead of declaring that I am the science and if you deny me, then you're denying science, Instead of that, if there was a weekly discussion to say people who are vaccinated in amongst them, here are the side effects that we are seeing, here are the problems that are concerning us, we are investigating them, then do a follow-up on that and say, we did the investigation, here is what we found, we think this group of people should not take this kind of a vaccine, this group of people should take this vaccine, and so on. I think that would have created more trust in the healthcare authorities and 
had their message more wisely distributed instead of simply saying, everybody roll up your sleeves and have your vaccines. I'll give you my example. In the case of our family, we uh, waited for the vaccine. I had said it for the whole year that as soon as I get the vaccine, uh, there is a vaccine available, I'll get it. So my wife, when she had the vaccine, she developed symptoms or side effects after the vaccine for three, now fourth month. And she was fine uh, for a couple of weeks. And then a couple of days ago, she said that, hey, I've gotten joint pains once more and my muscles are becoming stiff. And now you tell me this was uh, Johnson & Johnson. And if somebody comes to me now and says, I want to give her a booster for Johnson & Johnson, I'm going to say, get away until I figure out what happened. Why did the last side effects occur? What was the right solution for them? Why should I go for the next one without knowing all of those? So I think that wisdom in communication has been missing. And now it looks like a whack-a-mole thing that now just keep going after people who are saying things about vaccine. And it looks like a tantrum from the healthcare authorities. My apologies to use this word. Uh, so thank you very much for offering this balanced approach. Tell me this. The do you guide folks to say, hey, if you're a woman under 50 years of age, maybe adenovirus-based vaccine is not the best for you or messenger? Do you have some such uh, offer or you say that, hey, if you're healthy, please go ahead, take vaccine? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you about the adenovirus-based vaccine in, in that population. I think that's a, definitely a, a sign. Even though even in that population, the risk individually to any patient is low. It is elevated compared to baseline. And I think we have a responsibility to minimize people's risks and not to discount what has been described as minority harm. In other words, you know, to, for people who, I mean, we have seen people who get the vaccine who do get significant adverse reactions. In some cases, they can be months of illness, almost similar to long haul. And I, I mean, I, what, what concerns me is I think that the public health officials have taken this stance. We've seen this as a repeated theme that like almost like the public can't be trusted with information. We have to decide what people are capable of hearing. And it's always if we give them to the wrong kind of information, we can't trust the public to act appropriately with that info. So that happened with at the very beginning when they said, well, no, we're not going to recommend masks. Why didn't they recommend masks? Well, they decided that the public would give people a false sense of security. So again, they decided for people that they couldn't handle that information properly and therefore a very safe, low cost, low downside inter intervention like a mask wasn't. In, um, when you actually look at the rationale behind it, for people who have followed the things I've been saying about ivermectin, for example, uh, I've said that you know the evidence that we have would ordinarily, the, the profile of evidence to cost, to risk, to burden, to effectiveness of alternatives, safety, equity, acceptability, justice, that, that profile that ivermectin for COVID right now would ordinarily earn any drug like a grade 2B or 2C recommendation. And the reason that they opted not to do that was what? They didn't want to give people false confidence. It's like, when are they going to learn that, that you can't do that? You can't just decide that you are going to incorporate what you, how you have decided members of the public are going to act in terms of how you uh, engage in public health communication. And so for the, I think it, it instills much more trust to show that you are taking things seriously, that you are acknowledging this is a vast minority of people. However, we are concerned about that minority. We are studying this. We're going to learn everything we can about it, learn everything we can about uh, to whom does it pose disproportionate risk, try to exclude them from the pool who received that particular vaccine or intervention, as opposed to we have to just kind of put on this face of, no, nope, everything's fine, no harm, doesn't do anything, it's all fake. I think a more balanced, honest approach is actually going to be more well received by the public. Totally agreed with you. So we have a question, uh, one of the questions that is early on. So Dr. Yo is here. Uh, I hope you know Dr. Yo. <laughs> is it true that Dr. Osgood has a stuffed pink dinosaur that he sleeps with every night? Now, Dr. Yo, you won me that that thing at a carnival, and you honestly think I'm not sleeping with it every night? Come on, don't insult me like that. <laughs> so j just for the uh, for the folks who are new here, Dr. Yo is, our, is a very good friend of mine. Uh, he is a class fellow of the medical director for Dr. Bean, Dr. Ahmed Zafran. Dr. Yo himself is a very successful doctor. And then uh, from Incel DX, 
there is also further connection between Dr. Oscott and Dr. Yeo as well. So all good. It's all in a in a good uh, fun. Dr. Yeo asked you one more question, and that was, what is your spirit animal? Um, a ram. Hmm. Hmm. A, a rugged, masculine, brown ram. Okay, so it has to be rugged and masculine, or can it be non-rugged and non-masculine as well? Any, any, any ram. <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. So this is about the uh, with about the prophylaxis. Tell me this. So you said that you see less COVID patients because there is more vaccination, and so less people are acute COVID. Still, uh, when you were looking at the uh, acute COVID, or if you get acute COVID patients, you or your hospital, what is the um, whoever you want to talk about, what is the protocol? What do you do? How do you manage? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I guess, can I, do you mind if I start with how I'd approach it in the early ambulatory setting? Yes. Um, and so, so when, when I think about how I would want to approach a patient who starts caught, I mean, put it this way, if somebody presents with a viral illness right now, I'm considering it COVID till proven otherwise, I'm gonna send them for a test, but I'm generally not going to wait to start treatment. It's gonna be empiric and immediate. Or if somebody has a, they tell me they spent some all day indoors with somebody who just found out they had COVID, I'm basically gonna treat that as you've got this thing until proven otherwise. And what you really wanna do is you want to mitigate viral entry, you want to mitigate the potential for a later cytokine storm, um, for nuclear transport, for, I mean, everything you can do. And so as much as I try to resist using sports analogies and in particular American football analogies, I think of it as if you think about a quarterback and he's got a bin of footballs and he's taking them and he's throwing them downfield and there's a whole bunch of receivers downfield catching those and then running into the end zone. And the more receivers catch the ball and run into the end zone is analogous to how sick you get. Well, you want to, what are you going to try to do? You want to try to bat down the ball, rush the quarterback and bat down the ball. You want to cover the receivers. In my version, you can cheat. You can knock out the receivers and drag them off the field. And then if they do happen to catch it, you want to tackle them before they get to the end zone. And so if you think about the different mechanisms of the repurposed available drugs we have and the putative mechanisms by which they act, so we have ivermectin. So first thing, batting down the ball. Well, you have a medicine that we believe, based at least on, a, on in silica analysis, is binding tightly to the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. Right. So batting down the ball. Right. Um, you want to cover the receivers. Well, again, you have ivermectin for that, which we think is going to disrupt the relationship between the spike protein and the H2 and other surface receptors. And we have netazoxanide, which I'm starting to pay much more attention. We have phase two proof of concept and reported interim results from a phase three trial of a controlled release version. And that really seems to be a, another antiparasitic drug with very strong antiviral activity blocking multiple sites of viral entry that I think is, is very promising. So, and that is another very, very safe medicine for someone who's immunocompetent, very few side effects and drug drug interactions. Only thing is in the US can be expensive. So those, that's another thing. Um, and then of course, TMPRSS2. So for a male, you could add on like a dutasteride, finasteride type drug and others. Then as far as dragging receivers off the field, you have inhaled budesonide which downregulates the expression of the surface receptors in the airway by which the virus is going to, to, to attach and try to gain entry. And then if all that happens, tackle them before they get in the end zone, ivermectin comes in again to inhibit nuclear transportation. Now, of course, a lot of these mechanisms are putative and theoretical, but from some of our experience with these drugs and some of the clinical trials data that's accumulating, budesonide actually phase two, phase three data looks pretty good, even though open label. Um, I th so that's sort of just like a rational mechanism based, um, you know, sort of um, uh, multi-drug regimen you can use uh, to try to hit that virus at every locus that it can possibly um, have, have, a, uh, have, have a way to get into you and, and infect you. And then of course, you want an offense too. And so maintaining a healthy immune system in any way you can, getting exercise, a healthy sleep cycle, trying not to consume excessive, uh, you know, media content and staying off social media to the extent that you can and not, in, you know, engaging in the fear porn that we're seeing all over Twitter and social media, you know, appropriate supplementation of, of, of micronutrients, you know, balanced diet, maintaining healthy weight, all that good stuff, getting sunlight, getting vitamin D. And so that's, kind of the analogy of, of how I would uh, approach somebody in the ambulatory setting. Now, are we ever going to see a large randomized controlled trial of that multi-drug regimen? No, because it's not going to get funded and multi-drug trials get 
completely criticized anyway because you don't know which of them is so is 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 acting to what extent and so this is really just more of a um i guess a a logical and disease mechanism and pharmacology approach to treating a disease with which there's been a lot of success and luckily individually these these medicines are safe and have good trials evidence behind them now if you do end up in the hospital and you are sick enough to have to get to admit it if you're not sick enough to get admitted you may be offered monoclonal antibody cocktails in the emergency room um, if you're sick enough to get admitted and you require oxygen you have elevated acute phase reactions namely crp we are going to start methylprednisolone very promptly and you know i've had conversations with dr maduri who is just like the global guru of uh, of, of uh, corticosteroids and lung disease, who really um, has advocated for an initial infusion of, of 80 milligrams of methylprednisolone um, infused uh, over a half hour period. So I'm going to take a quick pause for any potential YouTube sensors and point out this is an academic discussion only. This is not medical advice. Please refer to the World Health Organization, NIH, and CDC and FDA for all informational purposes for COVID-19. Some of the things that we're talking about deviate from some, some of the recommendations of those organizations. Always consult with your physician and never take any medicine outside the supervision of your doctor. All right, let's make Thank sure we get that. Much. Let me, <laughs> um, let me let me let me resume. And so, and then um, depending on how sick the patient is, anywhere between one and two milligrams per kilogram per day uh, of methylprednisolone and just sort of titrated to the serial C-reactive proteins um, with, with the, uh, with the um, goal of uh, reducing that lung inflammation, that lung injury. Uh, now we have seen evidence that the most common form of lung injury is this sort of organizing pneumonia, this inflammatory pneumonia. But from time to time, you do see chest radiography that does look uh, consistent with viral pneumonia. Um, now, obviously, there's been a lot of controversy around remdesivir. Uh, it is something that's offered at my hospital. Um, I know some of the larger trials, Solidarity, some of the other meta-analyses have been not fantastic on mortality data. But I do think there was one trial that looked at the subset of patients presenting with a low uh, O2 requirement where there was a mortality benefit and there is has been industry data showing uh, reduced length of stay and then of course there's in vitro evidence that it may um, have synergy with ivermectin and so you know we we do offer remdesivir we're not really you know I think the jury's still out the extent to which it's 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 effective but I, I think it's a reasonable um, aspect of, of the management. Um, convalescent plasma has fallen off. I mean, I was never really convinced by that. Um, I think the largest, most well-designed trial at this point has been pretty conclusive that even with the very high titer samples given early, didn't show a mortality benefit or any <clears throat> benefit of major patient-centered clinical outcomes. And so that's kind of fallen off. Um, heparin, another one, anticoagulants that the studies have kind of been all over the place. And all of a sudden we were seeing trials showing that intermediate wasn't any better than uh, prophylactic and so forth. But now we have the rapid trial and preprint, which finally does appear that if you get it started earlier, anticoagulation is beneficial. And anecdotally, I can say that the addition early on during the first wave of methylprednisolone and um, anticoagulation was hugely beneficial. We were seeing patients clotting like crazy. I do think that a D-dimer targeted anticoagulation approach is massively helpful. Um, so there's that, of course. Um, let's see, there's that. Um, we started kind of cautiously introducing things like fluvoxamine and then um, and ivermectin to our patients. Um, we think that at that stage of the game, when you're in the full-blown pulmonary inflammatory state, it's acting more as an immunomodulator. It doesn't really have much to do with viral replicative phase at that point. But we do think that there is some benefit in terms of the immunomodulatory effect. There's a couple studies that suggested that um, We've seen rises in plate, improvements in low platelets as well as lymphopenia because we think it may interact with that CD147 receptor and improve some of the cross-linking that's going on with platelets and erythrocytes, leukocytes. And I've actually noticed when we've used sufficient doses of ivermectin that you'll see patients' platelets rise as they clinically improve as well as lymphopenia improve. Again, this is not what the major public health uh, bodies are recommending, but this is some of our anecdotal experience and what some of the trials are showing. It has been supported by what I've seen in clinical practice. 
Um, I'll say just in terms of my own sort of gestalt, I, I've seen all the different treatments rise and fall. And I've seen things that were thought to be promising. It was, there was hydroxychloroquine very early on, convalescent plasma. We talked about heparin and methylprednisolone. The, the medicines that turned out not to do much or the interventions like plasma, hydroxychloroquine, I never really got the sense that those were doing much. Um, I really feel, I felt strongly um, back in around like late March, early April when, when our hospital, thanks to our, our pulmonologist, who's a really smart guy, um, I think he had come across the, uh, the uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine statement, introduced it, and things got much better. Heparin, same thing. With ivermectin, I have noticed an improvement since we introduced that into our practice in the hospital. Um, so my own sense, my own sort of gestalt around that around that drug, and and my own just sort of um, you know personal experience and seeing how patients respond to it, I find it very promising. And I think the what the trials are showing is is consistent with what I'm seeing. Um, as far as fluvoxamine, I'm not really sure. I know that uh, you know doc, I, I really enjoyed Dr. Jalali's comments on on Twitter and, and in social media where he's talked about ciproheptadine, which I think from a mechanistic point of view makes sense. It's a safe medicine. We started doing that in some of our patients. It's it's kind of hard for me to tell if it's made an outcomes different because again our our end sizes have been low. We haven't seen many patients since we started looking at that and, and considering it, but. I think there's a strong case to be made for a serotoninopathy and pulmonary vasoconstriction. Um, I just don't have a ton of trials data on that, but from a safety and cost and risk standpoint, reasonable intervention. Um, let's see, what am I leaving out? Um, you know, awake, uh, when needed, awake proning, you know, um, really avoiding intubation whenever possible, uh, permissive, happy hypoxia, not really getting too aggressive with people that are doing well. Um, uh, symptom wise and not showing signs of increased work of breathing. Whereas very early in the pandemic, there was this rush to intubate. Of course, we learned that was not a good strategy. And we've learned that with appropriate use of things like HEPA filter, you can use high flow oxygen modalities, BiPAP, CPAP, awake proning, you know, vapotherm. You can really, uh, particularly with, with awake proning, get people's O2 up without having them decompensate and require endotracheal intubation. Um, and I mean, that's it's it's not it's it's really not rocket science. I mean, the the the, mm. the, uh, the treatment regimen is pretty straightforward. And if you initiate it early, uh, we don't have an intravenous ascorbic acid where I am. So you know that's that's something we haven't been able to dip into. But you get the treatment started early. You don't underdose them on the steroid and let them just be inflamed longer and longer and longer. You get started right away. You trend the biomarkers. You watch them carefully. I mean, we've we've had success. Mm. Got it. So before we go towards long haul, I'm going to wrap up with some more questions here from the cool beans. So I'm going to start from here, Dr. Sumit Kasare. Do you recommend a low dose steroid at home by, do by doing the blood profile by the oxygen of the oxygen is if fluctuating but not dropping drastically? Or if I ask my question as well that I had in the ambulatory phase or in the outpatient phase, do you end up administering oxygen or, or sorry, uh, budesonide or steroids? Um, I would I would go for the budesonide inhaled over systemic steroids in the ambulatory phase. Got it. And I'm going to do one more thing, so if you don't mind. I'm going to share these questions as well from Twitter too. Let's have one more question here from the YouTube. Luis Grande says, doctors Corey and Marek spoke this week about some prescribers were in trouble at their practice for using FSCCC guidelines, ivermectin. Have you or people in your orbit experienced anything similar? No. Excellent. No, I'm lucky enough to work in an institution that respects its physicians um, and does not try to exert that kind of institutional influence. And as long as we have studies to back up what we're doing and rationale, and we are being attentive and caring to our patients and our outcomes are good, they don't really have any reason to try to micromanage what we do. I guess I should feel lucky to, to work in an institution like that. I wish everyone's institution were like that. I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, really, congratulations for an institution that supports you that way. Uh, one more question from YouTube, then towards the Twitter. Genesis Light says, Dr. Osgood, have you seen patients who have been taking ivermectin but have no antibodies either from vaccine or natural infection? I have not had a chance to follow patients longitudinally where I would be able to answer that one way or another. 
Got it. Thank you. So here on the Twitter, Saj says, sir, my question is when I'm around vaccinated people, I feel sick. Suddenly I feel headache and my muscles start spinning. Also feeling pressure behind my eyes and some tiny blurry vision. Is this a sign of vaccine transmission and how can I protect myself? Um, I don't, I think that you are possibly experiencing um, a, maybe a psychological phenomenon because there's really no plausible mechanism by which that would happen. And let me, I, I don't mean that to be dismissive or condescending. I'm going to tell you a little story that um, a research mentor of mine told me when I started doing clinical research years ago, when he was running a clinical trial and they were doing a trial of what we call an intrathecal, when they basically put a catheter inside of your spinal space into your fluid and they were administering basically a cytotoxic drug to treat a really severe type of reaction. And it was a placebo controlled double blinded trial. And that he had a, had a subject, I shouldn't say patient, it's a subject, it's a research trial. And they administered the study drug and within about 15, 20 seconds, the, the subject, the patient uh, turned completely gray, started hyperventilating, blood pressure dropped, heart rate went up, pulse oximetry dropped. They were ready, they got the code card, they thought they were gonna crash. They had to stabilize, transfer to the emergency room. But, and then, I mean, every, everything was going in the direction of, oh my goodness, this sub research subject's gonna die. And then in about 10 minutes, it all dissipated, everything got better, everything stabilized. Because of the serious nature of that adverse event, it had to be unmasked. It was placebo. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that, and I'll give a personal anecdote where I was going for a procedure under conscious sedation, and they were wheeling me into the OR, and they started a drip, and I, I was under the impression that they gave me Versed, and I got really woozy. It was overwhelming. I got, I got scared. I said, I think you gave me too much of the medicine. I'm going to pass out. And the nurse said, honey, that was just saline. And so, again, this is not to be dismissive or derisive or condescending to anybody. What I'm saying is the power of suggestion is an extremely powerful phenomenon, and it is the reason why we need controlled studies to determine whether there are adverse effects from which we can draw causal inference and association to an intervention or treatment. Got it. Thank you very much. Chadwick says, my sister and I both had COVID-19. She gave it to me in January 2020 before any tests existed. So this is January 2020, last year. So we cannot prove it, but our symptoms left little doubt. Since then, I have been diagnosed with an innoxious form of arrhythmia, and she now has high blood pressure. Neither of us had either symptoms previously. Is it now too late to treat with something like ivermectin, or can we expect these conditions to improve or resolve themselves in their, on their own? Mm. I, I'm going to have trouble answering this without giving personal medical advice, which I can't do. I would say, I mean, I hope that you have a personal physician that you can run this by um, and get any appropriate testing done for more common routine conditions, and those should be ruled out. If nothing comes up and you kind of come up empty, um, I think it would be reasonable to reach out to, uh, to Dr. Um, Yogendra's uh, program and inquire about whether you know you could potentially get uh, testing. I want to be a little careful there and disclose the fact that I do have a relationship with Dr. Yogendra in that program, and I don't want to hide any conflict of interest. That would be a conflict of interest of mine because I am connected to that group. Um, it's just that I'm not aware of any other groups that are doing that type of testing. But if you want to find out, um, you could go look up on the web and find out what clinics near you um, are potentially doing trials. Um, I know the National Institutes of Health is doing a trial. Certain universities are doing studies and, and looking into this. And so what I would do would be to explore my options and find out all the information I can. Uh, and hopefully you have a physician that can guide you as far as what to do. Um, I just, I, I can't really offer specific medical advice to, to somebody I haven't seen and treated. So it would be a little hard for me to answer that. Uh, Dr. Bean, what do you think? Anything you want to add so, to that? So per perfectly uh, good answer. And Chad, uh, from a theoretical point of view, it seems like there may be a chance for the long hauler. And yes, there are drugs that are going to help. So once again, the 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 process of going through is the same. Talk with your doctor, see if they can uh, figure it out, or they're willing to look at FLCCC, for example, for the long hauler, and see if they can help you there. The other possibility is, once again, in cell DS, Dr. Yo. My disclosure, I have no connection at all, other than having Dr. Yo here through all my guests, or Dr. Bruce Patterson being over here to discuss their um, 
science or pathophysiology that have found we have no other medical or uh, financial interests. Having said that, in my opinion, it is important to look it up as a long hauler and see if you can talk with your doctor to treat it that way. Uh, Avox Mocha Bean says, all thank you for joining me for one more question, dear Dr. Osgood. Are we certain that long COVID is not transmissible? Or trans? put another way, do we know if COVID-free person can catch long COVID that will manifest directly as long COVID from a person with long COVID? I guess there's kind of two questions in here. One would be the actual phenomenon of long COVID, which looks like it's really more of an immunological um, and an and chronic inflammatory condition, which in of itself would not be transmissible. The other question is, does replication competent virus persist in patients longer than we think? And we have seen some interesting data and, and science coming out around that that might raise some doubts as to uh, how long people could potentially be harboring replication replication competent virus. And if so, is it present in their nasopharynx to potentially uh, have the ability to be trans, uh, transmitted to somebody else? Um, I don't know. I So far, I don't think so. I don't think there's great evidence for that, like epidemiologically and in terms of where we see spread and what we've seen from contact, contact tracing, et cetera. But for the actual phenomenon of the long haul syndrome, that is different than the presence of virus or viral remnants. So the long haul syndrome is more of a is a maladaptive reaction to the presence of viral material, which definitionally would not be something that's transmissible. Got it. Thank you. Then there is a PS. Mobin, I did pay attention in class. I do know that S protein is riding around where it shouldn't be. But I just started to wonder, uh, are we sure that all the variants, possibilities, possible, responsible for long COVID is in the individual and none in the virus? Because I'm eager to learn more. Thank you very much, Avox. You've always been a great sport and a great cool bean. So Ken Kaplan says, I would like you and a few of your favorite guests to comment on this highly speculative so I haven't uh, yet looked at it, so I'm going to pass over this. Fizan says, another how many day, after how many days is it it's safe to say patient is under vaccine-induced long hauling, like week or so? So I have seen patients after vaccine a few weeks later becoming, having lingering symptoms. Have you seen that? Um, yeah, I, I, I've seen a couple of patients report that. That it, it had been it kind of delayed after. Um, I think most people have pretty immediate side effects that dissipate after 24 or 48 hours or so, sometimes 36 hours. Um, in some cases, they take longer to go away. But yeah, there have been others who have pretty mild initial reaction, and then maybe a week or, or weeks plural later, they start to notice some symptoms. And that that I, I've come across that. Got it. Thank you. Not another mic says. Can you talk about nitazoxanide a bit? Dr. Osgood seems to see the good in it, and I would also be curious about your thoughts on niclosamide. So I'm going to put this question to you. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, niclosamide, I've kind of, I mean, I, I think it has a lot of promise, but it's not something that's readily available that I can prescribe. So I really try to limit my discussion to things that are kind of in my arsenal. Um, and metazoxanide would be one, although again, in, in the U.S., that could be an expensive medicine depending on the scenario and the coverage. But I mean, it's a medicine that we know has antiviral properties. It is a medicine that we know acts on multiple surface receptors to inhibit um, viral spike protein from meeting with receptors gaining cellular entry. And then there was a study published in The Lancet within the last month in June. It was a uh, proof of concept trial, double blind, placebo controlled, randomized, published in arguably the world's top reputable medical journal that demonstrated both virologic, if I'm not mistaken, and clinical outcomes improvement. Um, now, proof of concept basically tells us the medicine does something positive against the disease. Safety efficacy would be the next phase where you really get good estimates of how much good does it do? Does it have mortality benefits? What's the number need to treat harm? Um, that data we don't have yet. All we know is that it's been hinted by a company that's made a controlled release form 
which is a little bit different in how it's going to be released. But I, you know, I, I would think theoretically it's going to work similarly in that they have announced that the interim results of their phase three trial were positive in terms of patient-centered important outcomes. And I think considering the fact that this has a highly favorable safety profile for immunocompromised, immuno, excuse me, immunocompetent patients, that, that tells me that it's an agent that would be, uh, you know, good idea to use. I think that's a, that crosses a threshold of what I need to see to at least offer it to patients. I don't want to sell them on false confidence. I don't want to tell them I have conclusive proof it's going to keep them out of the hospital. Everything has to be a discussion with informed consent and being very upfront about uncertainties, um, you know, potential downsides, risks, costs, and it becomes an individual doctor-patient uh, discussion. So it's not something I would quote-unquote push um, or say that it's going to be appropriate for everybody or that every doctor should be prescribing it. But uh, what I've seen from that data compared to the, the safety and, and lack of drug-drug interactions with that medicine um, tells me that's, that's probably going to be an important uh, uh, member of the, of the arsenal of treatments we have to try to help people. And again, remember, right now as it stands, with the exception, I think the UK may have added budesonide to something that they recommend in the ambulatory setting. There is still to date nothing that any public health agency is recommending that you do for a patient in the ambulatory setting, as far as orally or, or in, in the case of budesonide inhaled available medicine, the first sort of juncture at which you can be offered something would be antibodies, and that's uh, you know monoclonal antibodies, and that's when you end up either in the urgent care or the ER. And so the effectiveness of alternatives is an important component in the discussion and in the, in the reasoning of whether you offer a particular treatment based on the amount of evidence there is, and there still continues and persists to be a lack of demonstrable and recommended alternatives. So as opposed to just waiting until you can't breathe and saying go to the hospital, as opposed to if we had a known demonstrably safe effective treatment that was you know, universal standard of care, that would change the math on it a little bit. I think considering that array of factors, metazoxanide is a is it's not like a panacea. It's not the cure. It's not a substitute for a vaccine. Uh, it's not a substitute for appropriate you know safety measures and and um, you know masking where where recommended and appropriate. But it is something that we can add that I think will reduce harm and have an effect size a positive effect size. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, Achilles Soralas says Sola says. If you are in position, I hope I pronounce the name correctly. Apologies if not. If you are in a position of authority, that is CDC or WHO, what would you change regarding their recommendations about treatment options, not prophylaxis for COVID-19? Thank you. Great question, huh? Hmm. Yeah, who <laughs> beans ask good questions. I gotta say, this is, uh, you know, this is this is fantastic. We have some, uh, some smart beans asking some fantastic questions. Well, I guess, um, as uh, I guess a broader answer as to just the general approach, if I were in a position of authority, I, I don't know if I'd pick one particular agency, whether it be CDC, CDC usually doesn't have as much involvement in putting out uh, recommendations for specific treatments, although it does have many. Um, I would say professional medical societies like IDSA, NIH, CDC, WHO in general, I would really try to remind people about the reality of how these organizations ordinarily go about recommending therapies and that it's not a zero sum game. It's not a dichotomy. It's not either we have conclusive proof or it goes in the, in the shelf and we don't use it until conclusive proof. And in reality, treatment recommendations and guidelines come in strengths and flavors, right? There are strong recommendations based on high certainty evidence, there are strong recommendations based on moderate or low certainty evidence. There's weak recommendations based on low certainty evidence. There's strong recommendations based on low certainty evidence. And we take the trial data, the cost, the risk, the safety, the effectiveness of alternatives, the, all those things we talked about, and we have all these different types of recs. And I would really um, scale back from this approach of like all or nothing, it's conclusive proof or it can't be used and go back to the reality of how evidence-based by guideline making has always been done and move away from this, oh, we don't wanna give people false confidence nonsense and actually give doctors that kind of guidance, like maybe, you know, give them a particular medicine, take ivermectin or nutazoxanide, whatever, you know, you have uh, evidence that is based on randomized controlled trials with important limitations of a safe medicine that's scalable, very safe, been around for a long time, low cost. 
why why not give it a grade two B or at the very least like a two C recommendation, which does a couple things. It gives doctors who want to use it and patients who want to try it the ability to justify it. It gives some guidance around dosing and duration, but it also does not relegate doctors who aren't convinced to do it because, oh, there's this high level recommendation at standard of care. So it gives that wiggle room and guidance and it leaves enough sort of wiggle room and uncertainty to acknowledge that further information may change the estimate of the effect, that effect and um, maybe some guidelines will have to be updated around that treatment. And that often happens and particularly infectious diseases. We know that the majority of these guidelines are from often just expert opinion with no trials. We're lucky if there's one RCT for a lot of this. And I would really want the public health agencies and professional societies to go back to that reality. Um, I think an assertion I keep hearing everywhere is that if we recognize that the ivermectin is often used, and if that were recognized, all of a sudden the vaccine emergency use authorization would go away. I, I don't see any evidence of that. I don't see anything when I've read the page on the FDA about emergency use authorizations that says if the Infectious Disease Society of America gives a repurposed treatment, a grade 2C recommendation, EUAs are nullified for vaccines. I don't think that's true at all. I think these things can coexist, and I think there's you can use tempered conditional recommendations to give guidance around treatments that lets doctors be doctors. If you talk to people at NIH, they'll say, oh, we just make guidelines. Doctors can do whatever they want if they want to use things. Yes, that's true, but when every public health re agency is recommending some against something, it's hard for doctors to do that. It makes them scared to do it, and I really think we would be better served by weak conditional recommendations as we have always done when it comes to evidence-based guideline making. So rather than any one particular thing, I'm going to answer the question that way. I would get back to the roots of real evidence-based guideline making and not this absurd all or nothing phenomenon where a pandemic is basically the worst time you could ever pick to, to, to bring about that new sort of zeitgeist in medicine. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, this is a more of a comment than a question, so I'm going to just read the comment and then go to the next question. Hobus says, I hope I'm not getting too insistent and annoying, but please consider giving some space for proxalutamide guys. So that is the proxalutamide discussion. Um, here there is a... Do you want to talk about proxalutamide or...? Yeah, I actually had a great um, um, email discussion and instant message discussion with doc, Dr. Katagani. Am I pronouncing his name correctly? Dr. Flavio. Um, and um, I mean, the, the proxalutamide data looks very compelling. Um, again, proxalutamide, I, I said before, I try to limit my discussion to things that I can prescribe that are in my arsenal. This is not something that's widely and commercially available, but that does bring about the discussion, what about the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors in general, finasteride, dutasteride, and does the proxalutamide data really translate to those other agents? I think there's some arguments to say that very well may be the case. Um, and I think, it, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned um, alpha reductase, or I, I think I said more generally TMP RSS2 inhibitors of that would be one of them, would be one more sort of tool and toolkit or, or weapon in the arsenal against the virus. Um, I think it's a reasonable adjunctive medicine. And I very much look forward to seeing what happens with this proxalutamide uh, um, you know, data and, and trial and whether that becomes uh, you know, commercially available. Got it. Thank you very much. Dr. Yo, we have already responded to Dr. Yo's spirit animal. So you have a brown masculine ram. A ram, isn't it? A ram. A ram. A ram. ram. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that I got all the properties correctly. So it has to yes. be brown and it has to be masculine. masculine. A masculine brown ram. Perfect. All right. So uh, very apt. Then there is one more question here. Scott Robinson says, what does he know about coronavirus genetic sequences patented in 2004 or 2008? I'm stumped on that one. Okay, so uh, I think there is some uh, theories going on that there are some of these coronavirus structures patented before. So I think we'll have to both read up on that to be able to answer that. But Scott, thank you very much for that question. Um, so I'm going to ask you some more questions from the, let's do this. Let's now focus on the long hauling and then I'm going to ask questions from the YouTube as well. So tell me this, 
what are the common symptoms that you see for long haulers and how do you approach their management? Yeah, great question. Um, they really run the gamut of every system from neurological to cardiorespiratory to, I mean, gastrointestinal, skin, eye, uh, ear, nose, throat, I mean, you name it. Um, I see a lot of people with just a lot of fatigue. A lot of it is just sort of nondescript middle age. They just don't feel right. Um, brain fog, we've heard that term, brain fog. People just can't concentrate, they can't focus. Exercise intolerance, they start trying to exercise and they feel so much worse. Waking up in night sweats, aches and pains. I think I already said palpitations, tingling in the extremities and the distal extremities, um, stomach upset, food intolerance, diarrhea. Um, I, I mean, it's it's. I've seen just tinnitus, visual disturbances, visual disturbances. Yeah, absolutely. And then it, just all kinds of things that I mean. Some of them, I'm, I'm, I'm probably like drawing a blank, but. There's probably a, a, a hundred additional symptoms that I've seen. I've seen patients um, exhibit like cyclical symptoms where they'll like uh, almost like menses. It'll come on like monthly or, you know, every couple of months and then sub and then, and, um, and then abate and then come back. I've seen uh, all different sorts of patterns. Um, I have, I've seen, uh, I've got a patient or two that, uh, they actually feel better when they exercise and then feel worse when they stop, which is the opposite of what we usually see. There's so many different ways that I've seen this present. Um, and then to the question of, you know, how do you target your therapy? I, you know, it seems that the patients who have more of like the brain fog and the ringing in the ears and those sort of symptoms, I think that like the SSRI, like the fluploxamine is, is a good, you know, um, targeted response to that, that I know some of my colleagues have seen um, some, some evidence of benefit. The, um, the sort of musculoskeletal and cardiorespiratory symptoms, um, I think, again, ivermectin pops up again and, um, you know, I, I, I think that those type of symptoms tend to respond a little bit better to that. And osmia is another one that seems to, um, and you did a great video, Dr. Bean, on the mechanisms of action of ivermectin and anosmia with COVID. Um, and, you know, we have the evidence from the Golden Hamsters. We have a good case series in a, in a small pilot RCT um, that showed the benefit on the effect of anosmia. And so anosmia would definitely make me uh, want to put somebody on ivermectin. Um, then, I mean, I know that there, there's the evidence around Maravarac where usually I am not going to want to put somebody on that without having the laboratory biomarkers to demonstrate effect just because without it, there may not be appropriate justification for medicine like that. Um, people experiencing symptoms of like hypersensitivity where it's more similar to what Dr. Pierce talked about with mast cell activation, you know, uh, H2, H1 blocker combination. So like a famotidine with either sertorazine or loratadine, it may be something I'll add on. Um, if it's severe enough, and, and there seems to be a, a component to it um, that may be uh, more of a hyperinflammatory state, maybe adding on a low dose of, of like prednisone, so systemic low dose steroid. Uh, statins, I think for just about any of these symptoms, I think it's appropriate to use a statin due to the multiple uh, putative mechanisms of action and some of what I've seen um, of, of the clinical benefits with that. Again, I have to reiterate, we don't have large randomized controlled trials. We really don't have controlled trials in general. This is all either precision medicine or just, you know, just sort of bedside reasoning where we learn as much as we can about the pathophysiology, understand the pharmacology of existing agents, use what works, engage our patient responses. And it's really based on that. We're being kind of very forward experimental. It's important to properly manage expectations and not oversell your confidence in therapies or how quickly people are going to respond. I think managing expectations is an extremely important aspect of this. Um, really getting people to engage in the proper mental health um, um, endeavors, whether it be seeing a, a, you know, a therapist, um, doing very light, um, non-heavy exertional activity, um, getting outdoors, trying to um, you know eat healthy, maintain a healthy, again, healthy diet, healthy body weight, all the sort of general ways of, of maintaining and optimizing health in that sort of holistic approach is, is I think, the, the way that you want to manage these symptoms in general. Got it. So uh, before the vaccine part of it, 
Just a quick question here. Michael says, I might not fully understand antibody-dependent enhancement, but would it be possible for it to occur with the new variants? I mean, theoretically, it's just we haven't seen evidence of it. Um, you know, and most of this comes from like dengue, I understand, with ADE, and I know people have raised ADE as a concern. It's just to, to raise theoretical concerns that we haven't seen any actual evidence of as a reason not to, in, to to utilize a crucially important intervention like the vaccines, I just don't think is a proper use of, of risk and benefit. If we do start to see any evidence of that, it'll I think it'll be pretty obvious and it'll be studied. It's just we have not seen any evidence of ADE in, in COVID nineteen vaccines. That is and I, I don't I don't think there's any re, uh, the nature of how that spike protein mutates and how these variants come about. I don't know that there's really a virological or a biologically plausible uh, rationale behind why we're suddenly going to start seeing ADE with some variant. I think it's unlikely. I'm not a virologist. I'm not an immunologist. I'm not an infectious disease specialist. Um, this is just, I read as much as I can from the, the most reputable sources I can. And this seems to be the consensus. Got it. You never know. Never say never. I don't, you know. Yeah. yeah. There, there is, uh, there are some studies as well that say that even when they try to produce this mechanism, in vitro, they were not successful for human cells. Uh, Nuna, Dr. Mubin, can you please have a cool bean shirt made for us? I'm a cool bean or something. Okay, cool, we'll do. So last set of questions, uh, Dr. Alpert, and thank you very much for your generous time and the information. Last set of questions is about post-vaccine injuries or long haul. Uh, as I said, my own wife has been going through this for about three, four year, uh, months. She had at one point felt that she has recovered, became totally fine. And then about three or four days ago, she saw some of the symptoms return as well, although milder and much better controlled. Have you seen people having side effects that continue after the vaccine? And how do you manage them? Yeah, so far, I've seen only a few. Um, I. Let me think. One, two, I, I, I personally at this point have seen four. Um, and it's very early. And really the way I approach them would be very similar to how I would approach somebody with long haul. Uh, so there's not really, really a really big distinction. I would, I would use the same sort of diagnostic and bedside reasoning and use the medicines at, at, at our disposal to try to, to mitigate. I think the pathophysiology is fairly similar. There are going to be some distinctions that we're going to learn more about. But yeah, I don't think I, I, I don't think my, my approach would, would really differ too much. Um, and, I, I, you know, working with COVID long haulers, I'm sure I will see more. Uh, I think it is important not to gaslight uh, patients who experience this or minimize it or pretend it's not happening or accuse people of making things up for the sake of like not allowing the the narrative that this can happen. I don't think that's sound public health communication. And I don't think it's fair uh, to the minority of people who are experiencing a diverse event just for the sake of the majority. I think we can be honest about this. I think we can be rational and understand that this happens to a small minority and that the overwhelming likelihood is that this is not going to happen to you individually if you get this vaccine. But when you apply any intervention to hundreds of millions of people, even things that are rare are going to happen to people. You can't ignore them. You have to learn everything you, you can about it. You have to be compassionate. You have to exhibit humanism in medicine, do everything that you can to help the patients to learn about that disease. And so I don't think we should censor our discussions around it. And I think it is an important question and something that is important to talk about. Uh, I do have hope and I think we will see, um, I think we will continue to learn about this. And we are seeing uh, patients benefit from this, from a similar approach to this condition. So I think it's treatable, I think it's manageable, and um, I think it's important to continue learning about it and discussing it. Got it. Thank you very much. So if you don't mind, if you have a few more minutes, I know it's about an hour now. Uh, there are a bunch of questions on the YouTube side. So if we can do a rapid fire discussion of those questions, uh, that would help some people. So ready? <laughs> ram. <laughs> Get ready to ram through the questions. So uh, first question. Bob FWD says, Dr. Mobin, is it okay to take Pfizer booster shot after three months of completing two Sinovac? And totally, you can say, 
pass on it or I would, just, I, 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 would, I would not deviate from what the CDC is recommending when it comes to vaccines. Yeah, cool. So continuing. <laughs> Logger head says calling out this guy for dismissing ADE. So this is a problem that I provide the answers with science. You start just going to call me guy. So do me a favor, logger head, go figure out the science and approve and then call me out. So sorry, I, I just become so upset that people cannot understand sometimes. OK, so continuing. Stratilize says, what is your protocol to use ivermectin to possibly prevent side effects before and after vaccine? Um, I would consult an expert like Loggerhead to, to, to tell me how to do that. Okay, cool. Next question, <laughs> MMSNBC. Are there gene variants that allow ivermectin to cause permanent damage to the brain as it can in dogs with MDR1 gene variant? Dr. Bean, you mentioned blood brain crosses cross with ivermectin. I don't know if I'd use the term damage the brain, but yes, there, well, there are there there are genetic profiles that do make people more susceptible to the side effects um, of ivermectin and um, have a more permeable br uh, blood brain barrier in terms of ivermectin. And it's 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 rare in the general population, um, but it's, it's like any medicine or intervention, risk benefit, and you have to observe patients closely for side effects. Stop treatment as soon as side effects become um, evident. Follow your patients closely. And uh, yeah, but yeah, no, definitely for sure that does exist. Got it. Thank you. And I want to just go back for a second to Stratilize. I know Stratilize is a cool bean who's been here for some time. Uh, Stratilize for the ivermectin, my personal uh, work with my patients has been that I continue them on ivermectin on weekly prophylaxis through the vaccination time. I know that I have had guests here who have. Uh, uh, asked to stop before a week or so before and then continue to stop a week or so after but i have seen that it actually helps to continue during the vaccination i agree thank you uh, moorhouse joplin do some long hauling symptoms depend on whether virus badly infected the lungs i mean what we see I think the best studies to date have shown that among the hospitalized, which typically are going to be people with bad lung infections, um, long haul can occur in up to 70%. Um, I think the percentage is lower among people who never get seriously sick, but it, 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 it happens to people who barely had any symptoms. So whether it affects your lungs or not, it can affect just about any symptom in terms of, of long haul because it's a, it's a different pathophysiology than the acute infection. Got it. Tuba Sterini says, uh, Dr. O, which works best, has least side effects, fluvoxamine or fluxetine? Fluoxetine. Um, I don't have enough experience comparing different SSRIs to really answer that question, so I can't. I don't want to. I don't want to speculate beyond my own knowledge or experience. So I'm going to defer. I apologize. No worries. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Martin says, "What a refreshing, common sense, great, intelligent doctor. One of the best discussions." This is about you. I knew it, that when we'll have a ram here, this would be the best talk. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Michael Caldwell says, have you seen symptoms return when patients come off of the medicines? Yes. And what do you do in that case? Try again. Resume. Got it. And a, a follow-up question. In your experience so far, what is the success rate? How many folks... Do majority or almost all or all become cured or heal or do they recover or, or do they become refractory? What is your experience? I, I, I just don't have, like I, I've listened to I, Dr. Hader and Dr. Antonados who have been doing so much of this. My sample size I think is too small to comment on any, uh, comment on any trends yet. I'm still kind of Got dipping it. those into this. Got it, fair enough. P. Lee. P. Lee J says, how is it not insanely dangerous to mandate people take any drugs released on EUA? Why isn't the true effect of mandating EU medicines removal of protection for humans? You know, I, I, I have to say that um, while my position is that anybody without a contraindication or without previous infection, antibodies, prime T cells should get this, um, I think it 
these types of things go against the principles of autonomy. Um, I think having something mandated before full approval on EUA has its issues. Uh, I think that the people who are put, you know, uh, moving in this direction have public health and, and sort of population health and global health and well-being in mind. Um, I do think there are, you know, bioethical principles that have to have, that have to be seriously discussed when it comes to things like mandates. Now, mandate is not the same thing as an employer deciding we're not going to continue to employ you if you don't get this done. And employers do reserve the right to do that. Again, I, I, I'm not crazy. Uh, particularly, we have hospital systems that even if you already had COVID and have antibodies, are going to make a, a vaccination compulsory to continue employment. I have some serious issues with that. Um, I think the term should be immunized, right? Just like anything else. You, you show up to work in, say, a hospital, for example, you have to show a record of immunization, and they don't make you get booster shots for things that you don't need. Um, I think you have to be able to demonstrate medical uh, necessity whenever you recommend an intervention. Um, but, you know, in general, yeah, things like mandates um, really start to weigh on concepts of autonomy. And I just think there's a there may be a better way to go about it. I think we have to combat some of the um, nonsense information that's propagating out there that's causing people to irrationally turn down vaccines. Like Dr. Bean said, I think better centralized public health communication uh, are preferable modalities than things like man, you know mandates in general. Agreed. Thank you. Sherwoody14 says, safe to take prednisolone after previously taken dexamethasone three pills and stopped six months ago, then methylprednisolone three months ago, a healthy 40-year-old with long-haul shortness of breath. Once again, we cannot give a specific person's uh, situation. Do you have any general comments on this, some educational comments on this? I'm not aware. I mean, there are, there's not a specific contraindication to use a different type of corticosteroid just because a different one was used before. Uh, the question would be, what is the indication? What is the need? What is the risk benefit? Is it appropriate to give it? Which, again, without seeing you, examining you, looking at your medical chart and your history, I, I can't say whether it would be appropriate for you. In general, having been on those other ones before would not suddenly contraindicate the use of, 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 of the subsequent one. Got it. So there's a cool comment from Luis Grande, who's a cool bean. This doc is speaking our language. Excellent. All right. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Genesis Light says, I wish my GP is as level-headed as Dr. Osgood. So very good. You've done some good uh, work here today. A uh, couple of more questions. Moorhouse Joplin says, do some long hauling symptoms depend on whether virus badly infects? So I think we we covered that one. This. Yes. Um, Bob FWD says, most long COVID is psychological, question mark, or PTSD, question mark, any markers. So meaning what is a long hauler sy syndrome? Um, I, I wouldn't say, I, I think to say it's psychological would basically uh, suggest that there isn't real pathophysiology going on. And I don't agree with that. I mean, I think there are some patients where there's sort of a vicious cycle where you don't feel well, you continue not to feel well, there isn't a great understanding of what's going on. Um, the tests that your, your, your um, physician is prescribing you are all coming back normal. That does start to affect your your emotional state, and your and it does have psychological impacts. Those in turn can cause symptoms become worse, cause people to start feeling a little bit of desperation and concern that they're maybe not going to get better, which can you know sort of exacerbate symptoms. That in turn can have more effects on your physiology, and it's sort of a vicious cycle. I think there are some patients who don't either don't end up registering on what we call the long haul index. Uh, maybe uh, there is a psychological impact of having been. Maybe they were in the hospital and were deprived of seeing their family and almost died and are having sort of post hospitalization, uh, um, you know, cognitive, um, uh, you know, uh, issues or uh, or musculoskeletal issues, deconditioning, um, that that certainly can happen after after a severe illness of any kind. But as far as the the actual entity of PASC post acute sequelae of COVID, no, this is a real pathophysiology and not just something that's quote unquote in people's heads. Got it. More questions. We're going to ram through them. Barbara Warren, great cool bean. Dr. Osgood, are you seeing a lot of athletes and younger people 
with post covid syndromes too as dr antonatos has been seeing i noted this after getting it too and having been athletic um yeah i have seen people who were previously healthy active in great shape either runners or athletes didn't take any medicines and and get in and became afflicted with this absolutely i wouldn't say i've seen a lot but i have i've seen i've seen a number of them yes you got it tuber sterini says thoughts please about the teachers who will be inside classrooms with unvaccinated children for the coming school year even if vaccinated good idea for teachers to use ivermectin prophylaxis so the teacher is fully vaccinated should they also be taking ivermectin because they're worried about the students if they are going to do that that would be a decision based on their perspective of of, of risk and uh, a discussion they have with their physician i don't have the data and the science uh to really back up that that would have to be done as far as to what extent are students young students in in, cl in classrooms a significant source of getting teachers sick and ill I, I, I can't back that up with that kind of empiric data. So that would just be more of a, your personal preference and whether you have a physician who's willing to do that. I would, to me, if a patient like that was a teacher came to me, we would have a discussion about it. And, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be completely off the table, but I wouldn't as a broad statement say, yes, that should be done. Got it. And I think that here is the most important uh, question for the evening. Texas Max says, what flavor of jelly beans do you like? So you have become oh. a jelly bean. Which flavor? Uh, there's only one flavor I like, cherry. Okay, so you are a cherry jelly bean with a brown a masculine ram. And there was something to do with dragon as well. <laughs> what was that? Uh, oh, so there was a pink dragon as well involved in this whole thing, correct? Okay. Yes, <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> all good, all good. So uh, one more question. M MSNBC says, if prescribed four tablets of ivermectin four times per month, could you take one every other day, which would equal, would low dose? So instead of taking four once, then another four a week later and a week later, he's saying, could you just take one tablet daily or every other day? Well, taking it for what? So I'll give you an example. So let's say I'm doing a prophylaxis and I'm asked to take 12 milligram, which is four tablets of three milligram every week. So could I just take instead of 12 milligram daily, once a week, could I take three milligram today, then another three milligram day after, then another three milligram. So a low dose, but every other day. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, as long as you do the initial loading doses, I don't think that would be a problem. I think that, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but if you wanted to, I guess maybe taking more at a time is causing you some side effects or stomach upset or something like that. I don't see a reason why that would be a problem. Got it. I said last question before, I think Cool Beans have become used to me asking more questions. Uh, TD, is Delta less lethal or is that due to vac vaccinations? I wouldn't say it's less lethal, but we don't have evidence that it's more virulent. It is more contagious. Therefore, it will infect more people. If it is equally virulent and more contagious, it will kill more people. <laughs> so, <laughs> Louis Grande says, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Bean Medical Lectures, you're putting together a weird psychological profile for Dr. Osgood. So, so Dr. Osgood is actually really, really cool, and he's playing along. So the jelly beans and the rams and the pink dragons, of course. So, so that is. Yeah, all I, 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 need, I sound like I need some like serious professional help. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually have a doctor like Doctor Osgood, then all you know wound up and stiff <laughs> yeah. professional doctors. So Denise TG says red jelly bean with brown ram and a pink dragon dinosaur, not dragon. Okay, dragon. Yes, sorry about dinosaur oh, dragon. All right, so here we are. I think we are at the end of it. There is one more question, so please allow me one more question, and that is from Colin Hemel. Why not develop a rhinovirus spray to see if that works? Are they even doing trials other than in vitro on this? They did. There was that. Uh, there was that just came out like a month ago, didn't it? There yep. was a, a nasal preparation that showed uh, a pretty pretty impressive. Uh, Effect size. Yes. 
absolutely and we talked about it as well so with this thank you so much dr osgood once thank you. again for the for the cool beans to reach out to dr osgood dr o oh, so good so d r o h s o g o o d at gmail.com yeah at gmail.com yeah so please and dr uh, osgood thank you very much for joining us thank you it's great to finally have face to face this is fantastic absolutely uh, we're going to have you again here as well i so love it thank you very much thank you for your time thank thank you for the insights and cool beans thank you very much for being here and for listening i would see you on monday have a nice weekend all bye bye